Um, in the late 1980s, I had the privilege of listening to Clem Santer more than once when he made his presentations on the high road, low road scenarios for the country with very clear choices that we had to make. Uh, and I think we are in some way, we are back at that stage now where if uh, we want to go forward in a different way, we have to change. We can't stick with what we have. That's quite clear. And um, earlier this year, uh, Greg and I and, and others uh, started a conversation on the question, what do we need to, to get the economy going in the right direction and as we need it. And, uh, and that, that evolved into the conclusion that it's not about the economy in the first instance, it's about politics. So that is where the hard choices have to be made and uh, for those that are in politics, it's quite clear what they have to do, but also for voters, it's important. And we have a very important next 18 months or so ahead of us till the next election. And for that reason, we thought it's better now to, to highlight those clear decisions that have to be made instead of waiting till the election campaigns might start because everything we do from now on could influence the outcome of the 2024 election and, uh, and therefore also determine the future for the country. So back to you. Thank you, Rolf. Uh, better the second time around. <laughs> um, uh, so we're, we're going to try and keep it as short as possible so we can take some q and A. I I know that some of you have a, a hard stop at around 12 o'clock. Uh, there is a, a, a light lunch to be served in the boardroom afterwards, uh, which you're very welcome to, to join us for. Um, uh, um, so we will be, be as, uh, as rapid as possible in going to this presentation, and we will make available a copy of it um, after this meeting. Um, just, a, just two quick brief uh, uh, issues beforehand. One of them is we have produced this now because we were dependent on uh, the outcome of a opinion poll that we launched uh, as part of this work. And that came out a couple of weeks back. And you'll see those results form part of the narrative of these, uh, these uh, uh, scenarios. The second issue is that this is essentially a, a scenario process in two parts. It's uh, in part about what happens in a few days' time at the ANC elective conference, and it's in part what happens over the next 18 months, as Rulf has pointed out, in terms of the political choices that will shape our economic destiny in a very class fitian way. We did consult with uh, Clem Sunter, among others. How do I get this to go down? Thanks. That one. Okay. Different my computer. Uh, Uh, and, and he provided us with a very clear methodology as to how uh, we should do this. And the, the overall aim of this is to build this fact-based model that outlines the consequences for voters, but also for the political leaders in the choices that they make uh, for the country. So this is really a presentation that follows the, the basic framework, which is about some rules of the game that we outline, critical in scenario building. Uh, secondly, the big unanswered questions uh, that we have in trying to develop these scenarios. Thirdly, the global context, in particular, the African context, and then the development of the scenarios. We're gonna follow this as we go through this presentation. The first of these rules is that we are moving from or assumptions is we're moving from a dominant party to a coalition government. Um, and I think the, the key uh, point to be made here is that the opposition share of votes is growing, um, uh, but that the, and, and that the ANC is sliding from a, a majority to minority status as a consequence of this, but also that the voter turnout has fallen from its peak 
of nearly 20 million to around 18 million, but from an electorate of just over 40 million to an electorate now of just over 60 million people. Uh, and you see this very much in this slide, um, uh, which the big question here is, is will the, the young people of South Africa, that blue slice of the cake, will they buy into the political system? Um, but also that the satisfaction is very high and that fewer and fewer adults are voting. And this inevitably weakens the government's mandate, but also weakens government credibility. As part of this, as these assumptions is that the realization that most South Africans, at least among those that we have polled, <coughs> want to see will be happy to see a coalition of political parties governing uh, South Africa. Second assumption is that there's going to be no growth without investment and policy certainty and accountable government. And critically here is to reflect on South Africa's falling share of uh, the global economy in terms of wealth per capita. It's perhaps the most valuable slide one can have on understanding our relative uh, uh, slide in terms of, of our position in the global economy. So South Africans have gone from being in 1960 richer than the global average on a per capita basis to today being half as rich relative to the rest of the world. And you see that this is particularly the case from 2008, from the global financial crisis, um, where we failed to, to recover, really, compounded, of course, by issues around Zuma and state capture. But still, we haven't made up for lost ground since that time. To, of course, get improved governance or to achieve improved governance requires fundamentally the rule of law. And while there was a dramatic fall uh, during the late 1990s and early 2000s uh, in the number of violent uh, deaths in South Africa, you've seen a, a rapid increase since 2010 for a number of different reasons. Um, uh, one of which is uh, the issue of organized crime and the role of mafia style groups, other criminal networks within the country in this sort of uh, uh, perfect storm of, of, of state embedded actors, uh, external actors, and criminal syndicates. Uh, and some of you may have read. Uh, Gareth Ackerman's think piece in uh, uh, the Daily Maverick yesterday was all about this issue and the corrosion, the corrosive effect that it has on South Africa uh, and its economy. And this, of course, has severe consequences for business. The fourth rule is really that you need skills and you need a skilled private sector and public sector to grow the econ economy. And South Africa has spent an awful lot of money on education, roughly a fifth of its budget since 1994 on average, uh, yet we continually lag on the skills, in the skills and matter, particularly maths and science among <coughs> those countries that are measured on these various indicators. This is the science score, uh, um, and yet, uh, and sorry, you, you see this also in terms uh, of uh, primary and, and uh, post-secondary education um, uh, and the relative lag of South Africa uh, in this regard. You, in spite of the fact that we spend more than any country on schooling as a percentage uh, of GDP. So we spend a lot, but we have chronic failure uh, as a as a uh, unintended consequence or as an output. The rule, the fifth rule is that our foreign policy alignment with major tra trading partners will drive investment and trade. Now, Asia remains our most important trading partner. 
um, increasingly Africa is important in terms of exports, and there's a tremendous advantage to South African exports and import ratios in Africa. Um, but our trade balance, of course, with, with Asia and particularly with China is negative uh, and negative in terms of the value addition uh, also uh, that we provide uh, to the goods that we export. South African exports, the majority still go to the West overall and to Africa. And if you look at the percentage of the BRICS and of China included in Russia, um, we don't match government policies with our foreign policy uh, well, and our policy rhetoric with our trade and investment needs. In fact, I would broadly say we are at odds with, um, with our trading and investment realities in terms of our bellicosity in international fora. And you see this particularly on the issue of Ukraine. Uh, so we indulge partners like Russia, but really they are insignificant trade and investment partners. Maybe they're more important funders of the ANC, but they're certainly in a bigger trading sense uh, insignificant for South Africa. So what are the big, uh, big questions for South Africa. If, with those assumptions in mind, what are the big questions that we're thinking about? And the first of these is how politics will play out in the short and in the longer term. I'm gonna ask Ray to run through this slide. Okay, so we have a series of three cascading decision points that are coming in the short to medium term that are significant. The first is, as we all know, coming up shortly, um, the ANC conference. And decisions made at the ANC's leadership conference will still shape the political landscape because it is obviously the governing party. So the ANC's elective conference, you've got basically three possible outcomes there. The one is the uh, RET faction winning with an NDZ or uh, Zwilling Kiza ANC presidency and the reform faction defeated. You've got the reformers winning and the Sora Mukosa, and then I just over the last week put a Paul Mashatila in there just in case because who knows um, if Cyril is impeached today or the decision okay. is taken. I found this on the web for a series. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry thought I was talking to Siri. Sorry, go away. Um, so, yeah, so you've got that Siri possibility. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got the divided party possibility. That's sort of where we are, where there's a contestation although the reformers have the upper hand. So then, the, the, you know, that, those decisions then cascade to the second level, which is the national election in 2024. So our view is that those decisions taken this week, next week, will actually then fundamentally shape how the election takes place. So in the event that the RET wins, we anticipate a ANC vote to decline quite dramatically to the sort of 42% territory or lower. In the event that the reform reformers win, it would stabilize around 50, although our uh, research shows maybe just under 50. And then the divided party scenario, I think it will definitely go into the high 40s because that's more of where we are at the moment. And then, you know, once that election has taken place, the third series of decisions will be made by political leaders. So we've got the ANC 4000 making their decision at NASREC. We've got the voters of South Africa making their decision. And then it will be up to the political leaders to make their decisions about how and who they align with in, in coalition politics if that takes place. So the first scenario there is that the RET is faction is likely dropping into the low 40s to require quite a lot of support probably from the EFF and then you'll have this populist coalition um, that, that that I think is a likely outcome 
and a slightly less likely outcome, although not completely impossible, is a coalition of all opposition parties, uh, the, including everybody, including Herman, I'm sure is, uh, has his own thoughts, which he'll keep to himself for now about that. But, uh, um, and, the, and, and of course the EFF. So it's like the opposition decides anything but the ANC, we are all getting together. Then you have the, the, the second possible scenario where the ANC stabilizes around the 50%. <clears throat> You get the same outcome that we have now, a compromised cabinet muddling along, or we get um, Roma Pausa saying, okay, this is it. Now I'm really gonna drive things hard in the reformist direction and, uh, and makes a lot of the tough calls and gets on with business. And then finally, where, the, where it drops into the high 40s, you have the, the two options that could result from that. A centrist coalition, the ANC leans the other way and looks for a partner or a two out of the other parties that are more towards the center, or alternatively an opposition coalition, um, which is probably a less likely outcome because a lot of the parties say they won't form coalitions with each other in, in, in those circumstances. And that then takes us to how the politics will play out uh, so, as part of it. Sorry. Okay, so thank you, Ray. I, I think the big question here is on the on the line three in the middle on CR drives the reforms hard. The big question is why would he if he hasn't done so already? What's going to change to make him the big reformer? Is this because he now feels emboldened? Uh, he changes his vitamins. What's the what's the, the the factor that's going to make Ramaphosa the big reform? Maybe it's these scenarios, but but we'll we'll get to the questions. Uh, in Sorry, no, what are the reforms, Mr. Duma? What well, it'll be the reforms that we're going to go go yeah. through in a moment. The types of things that would have to be undertaken. So uh, and the, and the sort of reforms which are going to get us out of that picture that I painted earlier in terms of the rules or assumptions uh, that we know where we are. Um, more growth, more investment, uh, um, uh, a, a tougher call on governance would be the assumption. So how will the politics play out? And these are some of the results of our opinion survey um, that it predicts that the ANC is going to drop below 50% for the first time since the 2024 election. Other opinion polls have them even lower than we did. Uh, some have them in the high 30s even. Uh, um, but this is what we found in our uh, sample across South Africa. Interestingly enough, this question about which coalition you would prefer to run the country, the most popular by slim margin, admittedly, is the coalition of parties excluding the ANC, then the ANC DA, and then the ANC EFF. Um, so it would seem to indicate that politics is coalescing in the center, uh, if nothing else, if you take uh, those first two groupings. Voters um, are, and this, this, these results are disaggregated by, by identity, race, and so on, but most voters, uh, nearly a third, uh, see jobs as being the biggest problem uh, facing South Africa, and then corruption, load shedding. Uh, um, uh, and that is, that is slightly differentiated across racial groupings. So, uh, jobs clearly affect, affect black South Africans more than it affects whites and affects some re regions more uh, than it affects others. Uh, notably, the Western Cape is less of an issue uh, than it is in, let's say, in Pumalanga or the Eastern Cape. And this is perhaps the most interesting outcome <laughs> for me of, of, of the opinion poll is that most South Africans believe that the ANC government of the last three decades is responsible for this problem. And I suspect that in spite of the ANC's brand as a liberation movement, 
that this is one of the reasons why you see this drop of support below 50%. Interestingly, as the generations not adequately represented around this table, as the generations move on, uh, apartheid becomes seemingly less of an issue. People don't uh, uh, cut back onto apartheid as the cause or racist as the cause. In fact, it was very interesting to note that in the disaggregation of the position on racist being responsible, racism uh, was, was, was a, had a high score amongst the white community, is that um, people felt that uh, racism among uh, uh, whites, or amongst the whites fold, uh, was, uh, was a factor, perhaps that's inverted or reverse racism. Uh, but uh, it, it's really an insignificant factor compared to the responsibility being placed uh, on the government itself. Um, and, and I do think that this is a, should be a major concern to the ANC. <clears throat> the big question here is then, can South Africa uh, attract the investment uh, to grow? Uh, what would we have to do in order to be able to to change the outcomes, uh, to change the current descent, and to uh, enable the reforms that Hume indicated. Um, and clearly, we need to drive up uh, investment. And this depends fundamentally on the political and governance outcome. This has a job dimension, of course. Uh, this uh, has a, a bearing on the ability of the economy to create jobs. Uh, it's not rocket science. You create investment, uh, you create the conditions for investment, you create the conditions to create jobs uh, across South Africa. And essentially, I think the, the, the election in 2024 is going to be a poll to an extent if these, these uh, um, uh, our own opinion surveys to, to be an in indicator of this, it's going to be a poll on ANC policies uh, to attract that investment, create that governance in order to be able to create jobs. Of course, it demands turning the tide on crime and disorder. Um, uh, th this is an earlier poll that we did uh, in July of last year. Um, uh, and the striking factor for us is how many people were affected by the unrest uh, and looting uh, and how close many South Africans are living to the edge as a consequence of it. Um, and this left behind a growing sense of uncertainty and vulnerability, but also a growing sense of the state lacked capacity to be able to respond effectively uh, in extremes. The question here is, can South Africa produce the skills needed to get the economy going? And, you know, there are all sorts of, all sorts of enormous challenges here, but our immigration policies, the alacrity by which home affairs appears to operate or not, um, our ability to sell ourselves abroad as a destination to those with skills which are transferable, all of these add to that picture that we are lacking skills in these areas. And perhaps one of the most notable tensions, I think, which we haven't considered and which we need to think about is what happens when, when some areas have increasingly differentiated rates of growth in South Africa. And I'm thinking particularly here of the Western Cape. What is this going to mean to politics in South Africa and the way in which regions respond to the center and the way in which they respond to each other? Um, and I, having interviewed some people in SARS, uh, I, I understand that uh, the levels of emigration of skilled South Africans are pretty much at an all-time high uh, and wealth is heading in one direction. So this skills picture is going to get worse before it gets better. Can government undertake the needed economic reforms? The energy sector is one issue, uh, but there remain major obstacles to implementation. I'm sure Saul can speak to some of these. 
In part, this is because ministers disagree with the reforms. Perhaps it's in the interest of their constituencies to disagree with these reforms. Uh, there's a threat uh, in terms of private sector competition, uh, the inadequate uh, skills, uh, but perhaps most of all, the establishment doesn't want its rents disrupted. And increasingly, I believe that this is a feature of ANC government, uh, and it's, it's tracking the rents, uh, which provides you with indication of where policy is going to go. Interestingly, our survey showed that uh, on economic reforms, that most South Africans feel that the private sector should be allowed to, uh, to participate in providing such services. Uh, um, maybe this will help to give the ANC the necessary confidence in so doing. Um, and that, that figure is just to go back there, sorry, it's over three quarters of the respondents uh, in the I don't mind, and yes, please do so, uh, according to those categories. But we continually see filibustering and blockages and maneuvering within government, which is going to delay these processes. And it's not a quick, and we'll come back to this in a second, this is not a quick solution. Um, it's as the Western Cape, which I think is ahead of the rest of the country shows, it takes a long time to get IPPs up and running, uh, uh, even in the renewable sector. Uh, can government get, it, get its finances in order? Big question as part of the reform package. Uh, this is government debt, um, uh, and it's continually rising. And then most notably, and I say this as somebody who just drove from Johannesburg uh, to Cape Town via uh, such high spots like Young Kempstorp and Hartswart and De Aard and Alice and Fort Beaufort and Makanda and a few other cherry spots on the way. You see this out there. The 22 out of 257, sorry, yeah, 22 out of 257 clean audit figure is very clear. So it's 41 out of 257, of which 22. Uh, our DA run, of course, is very clear in terms of the government's conditions on the ground. So when the rubber hits the road at the municipalities, uh, the governor's situation reflects both political composition, uh, but also uh, the frailties of central government. And here, I think there are better experts uh, around this table uh, about whether we can reduce the energy to grow. Um, uh, perhaps you would like to talk to this, Ray? Yeah, I mean, I think this is just the declining capacity of ESCOM to uh, produce electricity. So you you can see that the line, the trend is very strong and downward quite strongly. So I think the significance of this, by the way, is that if everything else is sorted out and you have the right leaders doing the right reforms and there's investment you still have a, a cap, a glass ceiling on, on economic growth at about 2% due to the absence of energy, because you can't turn that around short term. It takes years to introduce new energy into the system. And then these, the, this graph here, I think this you know, just shows you, I mean, you know about the low chilling situation, but since Early September, every single day has been low chilling. And you can just see how it picked up and it's entrenched. And then I think perhaps more uh, scary really is the rate of increase of low chilling is quite dramatic. So 2022 is a very steep upward curve here. And really, I mean, what this indicates is that the uh, rate of failure of ESCOM's generation heat is accelerating at a pace no one anticipated. So there was this idea out there that um, Eskom would be, uh, the best case scenario for Eskom would be some form of controlled crash landing. That's on an oxyboron, you know, you're a pilot, President uh, Karma, uh, but um, uh, it doesn't look very controlled, and but it looks like quite an expensive and probably uh, quite painful crash. And we talk about it a lot, of course, because it affects our daily lives. But the, the last three months have been particularly, uh, um, and doesn't suggest that this is going to have a happy ending. 
The external environment, of course, and particularly the African environment, is a big driver of South Africa's uh, fortunes. Uh, there's exponential African population growth about to occur. The parents of the two and a half billion African have probably already been born. Um, and you're going to see this tremendous increase from around 1.2 billion people to two and a half billion people over the next generation. Most of us, I hope, fingers crossed, will experience that. Um, and this provides all sorts of massive opportunities. And as you know, I've written many books on this subject. Um, uh, it depends on whether we continue to to respond to this in a business as usual fashion or that we do something different as to whether this demographic dividend occurs or not. Um, uh, and uh, if we plan for it, uh, we may look like Asia in terms of making full use of it. If we don't, it could be a demographic disaster in terms of migration and the consequent political tensions and problems that emerge from it. Um, South Africa has already had its demographic dividend. <clears throat> well, it's had its demographic moment. It hasn't had its dividend. Uh, we should have had our dividend from the early 1990s until now. There's very little difference between the, uh, the median age in South Africa and the global median age. There's still a very large difference uh, with the African median age. And that's where the dividend could take place and would be a real uh, bonus for our industries. But to do that, of course, we need cheap energy to add value to our products. We need easy trade to add, uh, to be able to ship them elsewhere. We need capital mobility. We need skills to take advantage of this uh, and all manner of things, which to go back earlier, we don't currently possess. So others inevitably fill that vacuum. But it is an opportunity for us, uh, which remains to be taken up. And of course, the migration drivers, as we know, are climate and the economy and conflict. Uh, and these are already present in many African countries. Uh, and we see these, uh, hear these stories, see these sites of people moving down en masse. That's unlikely to, uh, to reduce unless we are, are, in part, part of a considered international effort to mediate and mitigate the consequences of conflict elsewhere. Um, interesting to note that some of the refugees that have been discovered on the side of the road recently in Zambia were from Ethiopia, and that is just a, a topical presentation of the consequences of this. So let's go to the scenarios for South Africa, but before we do that, let's talk about the SWOT analysis. Uh, I mean, our strengths are that we have a a relatively sophisticated economy that's been built over centuries, lots of skills. Uh, we have a large multinational presence. We don't even have to attract it. It's already here. We have to look after it. Um, we have about two-thirds of the energy output we had dug uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. And we, there is democratic competition. There's, a, there's, there's competition for ideas. There's competition on governance. The weaknesses is, is that the liberation movements generally don't reform very well. Um, they tend to stay in power, uh, but they're not, they're not characterized as being great reformers. Increasingly, we're characterized by very deep tentacles of corruption, as was earlier indicated uh, in terms of global transnational crime. Um, uh, and we are a society characterized by extraordinary inequality. It's changed in terms of its racial composition, but it's still uh, very, very high. Uh, someone who's just taken this journey, believe me, it's uh, it's quite shocking to remind oneself of of, uh, of the poverty that exists in South Africa. In fact, it would be much worse without the welfare base that we have. Um, uh, but that, of course, contrasts with a shrinking tax base with 28.3 million people on welfare, uh, and you're not really. They don't really possess a, grad, a system of graduation off welfare. I'm not decrying welfare for a moment. Don't get me wrong. What I'm talking about is we don't have a system of graduation. Our system of graduation, our pathway out of welfare, essentially doesn't exist, has failed us. Uh, and there's elite dysfunction uh, um, in not recognizing 
uh, these pathways to change. Opportunities, of course, are really in Africa. That's about uh, our services. Um, it's about uh, reinstating our <clears throat> comparative advantage in terms of location and infrastructure, uh, and the big opportunities in terms of education renewal uh, and, and allowing more space for the private sector. Oops. And then the threats are that the political center doesn't hold, German, uh, that we have this upsurge of populism and the civil unrest that we saw last year that we see in terms of service delivery protests takes root that your this ratio of of 60 million south africans to 40 million uh, 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 a labor force of 40 million to 28.3 million south africans on welfare to 14 million south african registered taxpayers <laughs> to 3 million people working in the civil service that this ratio is just simply not sustainable it's not sustainable socially it's not sustainable ethically and it's not sustainable commercially uh, and this is compounded by flight, brain drain, and maybe even external extraneous political factors, such as we're seeing uh, in Ukraine right now. So this leads to, to four outcomes, uh, um, uh, which we'll briefly go through. And this is essentially on a, on a matrix of, of the top being more effective government, versus less effective government, weak economy, and strong economy. And the first of these, in true Western fashion, is the good, where we would like to be. Effective governance and a strong economy, and this depends on a whole bunch of reforms being implemented, on money being put less in consumption uh, than in investment, uh, a, a retention of the sound fiscal control that we have been used to at least at central government level, but increasingly at municipal level, uh, that we have a BE system that delivers to the poor, not to the connected, um, and that we empower our cities and our large urban concentrations, that we have uh, an activist regional foreign policy that seeks to reduce conflict, that we're not a reluctant participant in these processes, and that we have a foreign policy that goes about finding investment, makes us saleable. And I don't think we could even the remotely claim that we are saleable, except in a very smaller part of the global economy than we wish to access right now. Um, and the enablers are that you have, in our minds, a form of multi-party coalition and a centrist and realignment in South African politics to enable this to occur. The bad, in Clint Eastwood fashion, is the, the, the weak economy, less effective governance quadrant, uh, where you have rule by populists with very crude, divisive policies, uh, talk of nationalization, everything from the Reserve Bank to land to businesses, and the collapse of rule of law as a consequence. And there's essentially little faith. Um, uh, and uh, Pockets of this kind of behavior we see occurring right now, uh, and there's increasing xenophobia, increasing division, um, increasing cadre deployment, if that's imaginable, um, and negative growth, uh, and a small, tiny oligarchic connected elite in a sea of poverty, which continuously fed by a welfare system, but a welfare system which is probably largely in terms of its effect, effect inflated away. Uh, and this is, as Ray has already indicated, uh, where you have potentially ANC support in the lower 40s and an ANC EFF alliance to be able to retain power. The ugly is not dissimilar to what we have today, um, where you have government at least a number, but not particularly effective, that you have lots of summits and promises and announcements, but very little happening by comparison. That there's an unstoppable seemingly tide of lawlessness, very little in the way of, of, of uh, prosecution. So there's a political class which is protected in this process. But the regional flood of people continues unabated, and we essentially in a no investment, no growth environment. The investment is there to keep us going, 
just to keep existing operations going, but there's no fresh investment to mop up the sorts of skills uh, or the sorts of numbers that we are talking about as unemployed. And you continue with this capital and skills exodus. And we see the political enablers of this as being a very narrow ANC victory um, and then the sort of dwindling options uh, um, uh, which emanate from that. Uh, um, uh, and with, with very little extra in the way of capacity uh, or deal making to build power at the center. And then we, to, um, to coin a phrase, the fiscal of sense option uh, is uh, uh, a sort of mixture of, of and the idea of fiscal of sense are a mixture of, um, uh, of, a, of a sort of South Africa that works in parts. Uh, maybe you could call it fiscal of common sense. Um, where you have pockets of excellence and growth, um, some municipalities thrive, uh, and really this describes where we are currently with that and the ugly scenario, uh, but not where we want to be uh, in the good scenario. And again, it's a similar enabling environment, but there's a narrow ANC victory, uh, but a rent-seeking government, and that governance attitude doesn't change. So this is just pictorially represented differently. The good scenario uh, is that uh, you, you get uh, a coalition at the center or a coalition of opposition parties, uh, which delivers this at the center, Herman, um, uh, and that you have a degree of coherence around policy, about vision, about the leadership that makes big long-term strategic decisions and is able to exert authority and I go back to the question, will we see a different sort of Ramaphosa stand up uh, a, a, a political party that exerts authority at the center? Um, and these are the types of things that have to happen. You know, there has to be accelerated deregulation, accelerated infrastructure programs, uh, energy growth, uh, meritocracy that emerges, tough on crime and corruption, all the stuff that we know about. Uh, all the policy tools that we are aware of, all the language that we have heard, but very seldom happens. Uh, and we basically, in this scenario, scenario, reduce that disconnect between promises and policy operation. The, the, the bad scenario is that uh, you have this uh, RET uh, uh, coalition um, that you have much more radicalization in terms of all the entire policy uh, um, debate and rapid deinvestment follows and emigration follows less emigration than simply upping sticks and leaving. The ugly is that uh, there's a compromised government, um, there's a very narrow electoral victory, and that essentially we muddle along. Uh, what did Smut say? Never the best of things, never the worst of worlds. We continue in that Smutian tradition, um, but with a very much continue with a weakening, uh, not just a weak state. Uh, and uh, our tax revenues continue to decline uh, in terms of the overall demands. Um, uh, but while there may be elite accumulation in this scenario and these pockets of wealth, um, the, the, the middle uh, is then missing. Uh, and there's greater poverty at the bottom. And then similar in this, the fiscal of sense, uh, a weak coalition, uh, um, unable to carry through the, the, uh, the sort of reform agenda that we're talking about. Again, this pockets of governance in an overall sea of failure um, uh, in this scenario. So that's where we have ended up. Uh, welcome to take questions. Uh, um, probably not going to give you a very cheery message uh, as you travel uh, towards Christmas, but I think the purpose of scenarios is not to provide preordained futures. It's really to make people participants in the outcomes. It's to make people realize that the choices are theirs and that they have to urge others to make better choices, whether these are political choices 
bringing people together at the center, uh, um, providing levels of coherence, uh, um, and making them not just or turning them from spectators to participants in this process. It's always said, and I go back to Wolf mentioned the Anglo scenarios in the late 1980s and then the whole mutual ones which followed. Uh, it, it's also just said that South Africa is a moment night to night, you know, we are five minutes to midnight, we're about to tip off the edge of the table. Somehow, as South Africans, we always manage to, to muddle through to uh, make a plan uh, in that traditional South African way. I think, however, what we see here is that, um, to mix my metaphors, uh, our runway may be shortening uh, at quite a tremendously rapid rate. Uh, and we have to make that plan as quickly as possible, uh, without which we're going to have something of a smash at the end of it. Um, and, and critical in this, uh, to go back to where we all started, is uh, the political choices that lie behind uh, better economic policy decisions. Let me end there. Take questions. Sorry. Um, uh, you can unmute yourselves if you want to online, um, but uh, and we'll just ask people to identify themselves as around the table as much as anywhere else. Anybody have questions or queries? So you look like you're bursting uh, anticipation. I think. I mean, maybe a. Maybe just introduce a comment and then a question. Um, I'm Saul Musk. I work in the president's office um, in the PMO, which is um, a kind of delivery unit for King on economic reforms uh, operation, both in Cleveland and in other areas. So very much at the call base of many of these problems. Um, and I think that you know what what comes through very clearly is there are certain outcomes that that need to happen. There are certain things that need to be done if South Africa is going to be, um, if, if, if the economy is going to grow, if it's going to create jobs and so on. Um, and you can almost separate that to some extent from political um, questions. Uh, part of the problem, I think, is how you build a consensus around those things um, that people can agree on um, and that that can be implemented um, regardless of 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 what um, what what trajectory the political um, situation takes between now and 2024. And I'm not sure that we have that um, yet in the country. I'm talking about not a consensus among politicians, a consensus within the country, consensus among South Africans about what um, what the economy should look like, what, what mix of policies will get us there. Um, and this, I think, helps with that. So that's not to say the political outcomes don't matter. Of course, they do They're completely. They will make or break um, all of that. But it, it is a battle also for ideas um, about the role of the state and, um, and so on. But just to make that point, I think this kind of uh, this kind of exercise is useful in sharpening that, in showing people, you know, at certain key inflection points, um, what decisions need to be taken to avoid one route and and, and achieve another. And I, and I agree with with pretty much everything that you've outlined in that respect. And you do then get to the political question. And, and to me, there are two really big questions that we still have to answer. Um, the first is, if there was at some point a coalition government in South Africa, how would we ensure that that le leads to the outcomes that you proposed? Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I'm not sure that that's at all certain as things stand. You have here the kind of one of one of the possible trajectories is a multi-party coalition government or a coalition that includes the ANC and some smaller parties of the ANC and the DA. Whatever form that takes, it could take multiple forms. 
um, a lot of people see that as um, as a good thing because it would create would provoke some sort of change in the system. But what we've seen, for example, in Johannesburg in the last six years, um, with apologies to the former mayor, although I think he probably would would know better than any of us the challenges of a coalition government in these kind of circumstances. But Johannesburg now is six years into coalition governments is in complete freefall. The city is, is in decay and the administration of the city has been destroyed, dismantled. There's almost nothing left of the city. We've had coalitions for six years. So how do we prevent that? <coughs> from repeating itself at a national level. There's no guarantee that a coalition won't be unstable, won't produce stalemate, won't produce backsliding or an inability to make decisions. Um, and I think that needs to be taken very seriously. Whether the ANC is in that coalition or not, the same challenges will exist. Um, and that's not to say there aren't things you could do. I think there are a lot of things you can do to stabilize coalitions and make them work effectively as they do in many countries. The second set of issues, I think, is about the state itself. So underneath the politics, regardless of who is in power in 2024, what we've experienced in the last three and a half years is, is a state of bureaucracy that is that has been hollowed out over the last decade, and it's become trite to say that. But whoever takes power, whether it's the ANC with the president um, commanding a majority or a coalition or whatever, that problem is an intractable problem. And I think that's part of what's happened perhaps in Joburg and in other cities with tech coalitions, that if you layer new politicians on top of a broken, service for broken bureaucracy. It's very difficult still to get things done. And how do you how do you fix that, that state capacity problem? Um, we have a situation now in South Africa where often decisions are taken, including on on reforms, on economic reforms. But to get those decisions to filter through through the system um, is is extremely difficult and complex. And it's not as simple as, as issuing instructions <clears throat> because there are, in many cases, tens of thousands of people involved in implementing um, a direction who all need to be doing their jobs at any given time in order for the system to work. Uh, and that, that, to me, seems, whether you look at ESCOM and it's you know, 50,000, 40,000 employees for the state and it's two and a half million employees. We've got to fix those systems regardless of it gets still people into doubt. Thank you. Um, but I think those are the things. I do think the, the outcome of the city of Johannesburg, of course, is not, you know, it's not going to be fixed overnight because it's taken an awful long time to get to where it is. Um, and you know the sad axiom, which is the period of recovery is at least as long as the period of decline when you're dealing with states or municipalities. I asked Alan Windy this question. And I know people like to go, oh, but it's the Western Cape, and it's sort of Western Cape exceptionalism. I asked him on the weekend about how the hell they turned it around, because that it is turned around relative to the rest of the country whether we like it or not. That's what all the indicators illustrate. Why is the governance in the Western Cape so much better? And he said to me, and I'll, I'll reflect that back to you, he said, you have to get governance to become a habit. And you start that with auditing outcomes. And then you can focus on service delivery. And then, of course, values, leadership, vision, organizational culture uh, is important. But he said, governance, no stealing, he wrote back to me. And doing your job is the first key starting point. So that's an issue of political accountability. And I always get the sense that we're trying to 
we're trying to answer these questions, and this is controversial, by saying, by not identifying the problem. We need to identify what the problem is, and then try and answer the question based on the problem identification, and not solve the wrong, wrong thing. And do, I, I just wonder, rhetorically, whether expecting the political party that has got us into this mess, as most South Africans seem to indicate, to expect them to get us out of this mess is um, sensible. So you might have a, a view on this. Um, and then, uh, well, I think uh, as regards uh, the uh, instability of uh, the coalitions, in particular, Johannesburg uh, had uh, the privilege to run a multi-party government with seven parties. And uh, the fact that they, it was the most uh, stable coalition in this country. Unfortunately, the instability was not something that happened by accident. It was engineered um, uh, mainly by the ANC. I think from day one, uh, they ensured uh, used uh, state resources uh, to make the government unstable. Uh, that on record, um, where you have uh, the provincial government and the national government run by, <coughs> by the ANC, who openly declared uh, to make your government ungovernable because that's what they were trained uh, by the Russians for many years. So what they know is, uh, is to make governments ungovernable. And uh, eventually they succeeded. Um, and they're repeating the same movie. Um, Again, so it's not the question of coalitions that are unstable, but when you have uh, government itself uh, making municipality ungovernable, it's, 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 it's a very difficult uh, situation. And I think uh, as regards uh, to Greg, what you guys have presented here, um, uh, for anyone who believes uh, ANC uh, is, uh, or civil reformers, or the reformists, uh, are the answer to this country's problems. I think we must be living in two different worlds. It's, it's like, uh, for me, uh, what uh, it's been uh, uh, conveyed or suggested is like uh, asking uh, the prisoners uh, to assist us uh, to strengthen uh, um, security in prisons. Uh, you know? So there's just no way that uh, anyone can expect the NC to be part of the uh, solution to solving uh, this country. Because there's no difference. Uh, don't add anyone, uh, for me, you tell me there's a, there's a, the NC of Cerro Ramaphosa or the RET, the RET. There's no, there's only one NC and there's one the NC. So uh, this question of uh, us actually fooling ourselves that uh, there's a better ANC Unless I, I, I live in a totally different world, or my lived experiences uh, are totally diff different. So I don't really see the NC being uh, uh, the solution to this country's problem. Come 2024, ANC is still in power. If it does happen, and which is most unlikely, as far as I'm concerned, the numbers you put in there, no way ANC will get anywhere close to those numbers, in case they get there. I can tell you there's no way South Africa will make it to 2029 because um, uh, NC um, people in government, they're not in government uh, to save society or, or deal with the issues to solve this country's problems. Uh, you know? So that's where obviously I think for me, um, uh, using my common sense and my lived experience, um, yeah, anyone who tells me that ANC is going to be part of uh, solving this country's problem, I, I have a very, very diff uh, different uh, view to that. Uh, and, and I've made it clear, um, and I'm making it really very clear to you um, that, um, you know, for us uh, to really be in coalition with the ANC, it's not possible. It's highly impossible. It's also very impossible to go into a coalition with the EFF at national government level. The two, ANC, I regard them to be a criminal enterprise. 
so I can associate with criminals. Uh, there's no way uh, in my life uh, 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 that uh, Herman Masha will be associated with a criminal enterprise. Secondly, EFF, we have major um, policy differences at national level. I've worked with them at local government level. They are the most supportive. Uh, we can have differences uh, around service delivery because at local government level, it's about deciding which street to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to tar as opposed to the next. No policy differences, but I cannot really see where I must have engagements with any political party, EFF in particular, around issue of economy where I must be expected to run bakeries. Can I don't know the government to run bakeries, construction companies, own banks, so or land expropriation without compensation. So these are fundamental issues that are not negotiable at national level, because at national level, that's where you set up uh, policies. So that makes it really very difficult for us or for me. Uh, in terms of uh, forming a coalition um, uh, government at that, uh, uh, at that level. That's why we've got to work hard to make sure that uh, we, we bring the NC and EFF way below the 50% uh, threshold so that they are unable to form uh, the government. And we can form governments with uh, like minded other political parties. But we sit with another challenge in terms of. We don't know where the DA sits as far as these issues are concerned. And uh, you have mentioned on more than one occasion around the, the, the DA where they, they govern, they govern well. Uh, my personal experience is completely different because I think we need as a country start really looking at uh, what we mean by proper governance. Um, because uh, of, I'm 63, I lived more than half of my life under apartheid, and government, uh, apartheid government produced um, the best, one of the best infrastructures in the world, but obviously uh, targeted at, uh, at a few white minority. But the, the infrastructure development was one of the best. AC took over this government with uh, infrastructure, which was world class. They just needed to really expand it, but obviously the Russians taught them to destroy and not destroy uh, uh, what uh, the apartheid government um, had built. <clears throat> and I can tell you, just give you an example, my first visit uh, to uh, Cape Town was in January of 1985. Uh, I had an opportunity to, uh, someone introduced me to Dr. Mampelo, Mampelo used to, was paid in the Western Cape, took me around uh, the, uh, the townships and the colored areas. And obviously subsequent to that, I've been there hundred of thousand times. I can tell you right now, go to Kailish or Google it. Much worse than it was in 1985 when I visited there. Uh, if you look at service delivery. So, then what we mean by uh, um, uh, good service delivery, because if you're providing services, um, you don't provide services to all South Africans, you've got a challenge. And the reason why uh, I left uh, the, um, the, the mayorship uh, ahead of uh, the five years, uh, it was because um, major differences I had with the DA were not happy with me providing toilets uh, to people who've not had toilets uh, for 10, 15 years. And they say, why must I take the residents' money uh, to provide uh, services to people who don't pay taxes and uh, so forth? So these are the so these are the issues. And I'm not saying Cape Town is not running well. It's like I mean, apartheid uh, ran this country well, but well. But at the end of the day, the impact on, on the rest of society. So even where they govern, I've got a practical example uh, when I was the mayor. That's what made me to live, uh, is because DA did not want me to provide services to the poor black communities. Let me um, uh, go to you, I don't know that there's a couple of people hands up. We'll draw to <clears> that. Okay. okay.
so much. I just uh, Greg and Rolf Ray, it's really an interesting piece of work. And thank you for helping us to think these things through in a systematic way. Um, just two quick comments uh, around the, you didn't give us much, much information on the survey. I know it was reported in the media and stuff, but surveys have got a bad reputation these days all around the world. So I wouldn't hang too much on it unless you understand the methodology a little bit more. But then with regard to the scenarios, um, <clears throat> it's made me think of something as I'm looking at your good and your bad. In the good scenario, the ANC must do quite well, but not get 50%, and then must find some coalition partners to work with it in a centrist way to improve the outcomes. In your bad scenario, the ANC must do really badly, and then it runs to the EFF to hold on to, to something and I'm just wondering whether those are plausible scenarios, you know, whether they're plausible, because my fear, I suppose, we're all talking our lived experiences and such. My fear is that the ANC would be very likely to move close to the FF very quickly, um, even if it got to 48%, you know, and given that there's, given the racial politics of South Africa, given the demographic, the demographics of South Africa, given that the youth league of the ANC is missing and all sorts of uh, connections that exist. So that for me is not necessarily plausible the way you put together the good and the bad being so far apart. That kind of, for me, there's a very strong likelihood that if the ANC falls below 50%, the, ANC, the government could become very unstable in ways that have been described very, very quickly. And I'd like you, as the people have put this together, maybe Ray and others, just to think about that, whether this is a realistic good scenario does our body politic have those kind of coalitions of the center? Or will we actually move away from the center? Because maybe the ANC being in power wasn't perfect, but I think it coming out of power might be worse. Thank you. Yeah, you want to answer? Yeah, well, uh, you know, that's trying to shoot down the only hopeful possibility. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's almost Christmas. <laughs> I mean, I think that in that scenario, you know, if the ANC is at out of 47%, mm -hmm. a whole lot of other options come into play. For example, I, which, um, you know, would be sufficient actually uh, to propel it over 50%. And it might not want to make the big compromises that the EFF will demand in exchange for 2.5% uh, to get over the top. So I think it is quite likely that they would look to smaller parties in that scenario. And those smaller parties are going to be in the center. And um, but of course, it depends on the reformists within the ANC before that, having the other hand. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it is a terrifying scenario that you, you're painting, that there might be this compulsion to just go all the way, even you know, as soon as one drops below 50. But um, there is some um, can yeah. this perennial South African scenario, which is we have to keep the ANC, which I hear and what you say, correct me if I'm wrong. We have to keep the ANC above 50% because the alternative is too ghastly to contemplate. Um, and this is the you know, better the devil you do than don't know. We can phrase it in a whole bunch of ways. However, our lived experience, to use your terminology or your terminology, is that's where we are now. And what gives us hope that that's going to deliver a different outcome in that sort of Einstein definition of madness way? So we are there. And I think the one thing that South Africans are notorious for is what I would describe which was described to me about in Afghanistan uh, in a different context, which we'll all be aware of, and as a conspiracy of optimism. So we continuously con conspire in believing that there's an optimistic outcome in having a configuration in the ANC. Is that realistic based on what we know? I, I don't know. I'm just asking that question. Is that realistic based on what we know? Is it not a better outcome or a more likely reformist outcome? Because that's what we need. And not just reforms as stated, but reforms as 
delivered on <coughs> in a different political configuration. I guess that's the nub of these scenarios, is do you need, and, and, and Herman has his view, it's clear, do you need a different political configuration to deliver reforms? Now, we know, what we know is that in South Africa, <clears throat> different political configurations have delivered reforms. They may not be perfect. Herman has his view about the Western Cape. Uh, they, they may not be perfect. We know what happens in, 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 in other metros, <coughs> for instance, but we do know that they do deliver change. So there is this inbuilt fascination with the ANC above or below 50%. Let's keep uh, it above 50% because that's the way that reform is most likely to happen. Whereas our lived experiences, in fact, it doesn't happen. I don't know, but uh, that, sorry, can I just go to one question online, uh, um, which is, which is um, Mark and Ferguson, then we'll come to you and then you can have the last word. How's that, Mark? <coughs> Unmute yourself. Thanks, Greg. Very much. Um, yeah, my, my question uh, is predicated on a strange and uh, rather unknown fact. There's never been a change of government in South Africa with, without a coalition. Every single government since 1910 has changed as a result of uh, a coalition winning an election. Uh, even the government in 1948 was a product of a coalition between the National Party and the Afrikaner Party. So it's very clear that any change of government is going to be the result of a, a coalition, which I think is very clear from the scenario that you've sketched. I think, however, one of the things that I didn't really see enough of in uh, <coughs> the assessments that you did was something which focused more on um, a scenario regarding what uh, opposition choices there are. Clearly, uh, an ANC EFF coalition is something which we know because of its populist character, and you've done enough uh, study of populist governments to know that those simply deliver disaster. So something that uh, is, is a concern for me is the kind of scenario that Herman sketched a short while ago where there isn't acceptance that the ANC will be part of a governing coalition come the 2024 election. Um, and it'll be a choice between an opposition either to the left, which is with the EFF, or to the right and center, which is with DA and Herman and others. But for the foreseeable future, the ANC is of a character that I doubt that any election will deliver a situation where the ANC will willingly part with power, even in a coalition, and will willingly accept if, uh, if coalition partners uh, on the center right are not willing to share power with them, as has been made by, clear by both the DA and uh, by Action SA. Uh, they will then find a natural home with the, with the EFF, and we all know what that brings. And I'd like to just hear some, some thinking and thoughts about, uh, about those choices, because my personal um, opinion about uh, opposition behavior in South Africa is, given the realities that we face, uh, by excluding options, to be in a coalition with uh, the EFF, for example, rather than with the, the ANC, brings very bad consequences in terms of uh, a municipal government, as we've seen in Johannesburg and as we've seen uh, in Ekuruleni. Um, but there are good people in the ANC. It's a nonsense to assume that there aren't good people in the ANC. I know many of them. And I'm sure Rook does, and I'm sure you do too, Greg. There are many, many good people in the ANC who are appalled by the way in which the ANC has become a criminal organization. So I'd like to, to, to just hear some thoughts on what the options are and why the only uh, option is to go the route of an EFF coalition or uh, an anti-ANC coalition uh, by center right. I don't think that the the, the character of your findings 
is going to uh, to lead to 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 those kinds of choices if uh, if uh, uh, the ANC has to choose between one or the other, and the uh, opposition on the centre right doesn't make it attractive enough for the ANC to be part of a governing co coalition together with him. Thank you, Malcolm. The question here, and then we'll yeah. Thank wind you. up. My name is Muzi. I come from an organisation called South West Promise. We took the first Kumilai. This is the end of organisation. We took the first flight into Peter Maritzburg after the, the looting and the violence. And one of the things we're really interested in is why some people succeed, why Tiger Woods is better than the next guy, or Muhammad Ali is better than the next guy. So we do a lot of research around these areas. And so we do work with a lot of data, and I used to teach scenario planning at UCT and, and marketing. Um, so there's one thing that is important. I think I always say to people, data is like a G-string. What it reveals is amazing. <laughs> what it hides is, is the crux of the matter. <laughs> and what's a G string? And we do a lot of research kind of with golfers, you know, we get the data for everything. And it'll tell you how 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 you know what distance you get with certain iron and the kind of thing. But the one thing it doesn't tell you is the mood of the player on the day. And you can't get that, you know, how thick the grass was in this particular hour. And there are a lot of things that you just can't get by virtue of our research done. So, and what I, I really like this, um, and how I always say to, to my clients is, you know, do I take an umbrella or do I take a swimsuit? A swimsuit? If I go to Durban, it's going to rain, in which case I use an umbrella. The one thing that, if it's rain, I have to use an umbrella. If, if uh, can swim and have a good the beach. What I think we should brace ourselves is that South Africa is going to be in turmoil till 2029, extreme turmoil, because the one thing that is missing is the heart of the leader. You know, the one thing that you can't see, the data can't tell you. And we don't have the leader right now. So Peter Maritzburg, there was extreme violence uh, before the elections of 1994. Mandela went there and read the riot act to the ANC guys. He said, we are going to have elections and you guys are going to, to, to go and canvass. The current president said he wasn't going to the conference until at the last minute because he was scared they were going to demonstrate against, against him. So the one thing, the mood, the, 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 the character of the player, that is what we need. Um, to change South Africa. And then one last thing, one of the things I really love about Dr. Ruk Mayer, he, he once said that they liquidated apartheid. I grew up in the 80s. When somebody talks to reform, I go, oh my God, here's another accident, here's another slow death. And the reason was because you could not reform apartheid and you liquidated it. And what we need now is to liquidate the system and come up with a new system. Uh, you the law. It's just a, just I'm in the mining industry, and the mining industry is a very good example of, of 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 all the ills of this country. It requires a lot of investment. It's static; you can't move it, and it's very vulnerable to criminality. And at the moment, um, the mining industry is in a disastrous situation because of criminality. The involvement by the police in the criminality, the involvement by the municipal councillors in the criminal criminality. I mean, Greg and I, when we visited the Zamazamas in the West End, the Zamazamas told us that the police moved the concentrate for them. And they the police moved the concentrate for them at night. So we said to them, why do they move it at night? Because they're scared that people see it's the police. They said, no, they're scared because the other gang shoot at them. So I, I know from personal daily experience, the extent of the criminality is massive. And um, I don't think we're going to resolve this country's problems. And sorry to give you a problem for every solution until we resolve the criminality in this country. I think the ANC is so permeated by criminals that unless the, the ANC is liquidated, to use a term that somebody uses, we're not going to win this battle. Because <coughs> my experience, the extent of the criminality and involvement in, in the industry I'm involved. Just before, 
Well, I just show. Sure. I'm not going to say much because I'm a guest. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I'm surrounded by South Africa, so I don't want to upset anybody. But I just want to make reference to your, um, your, your figures, the percentages of the vote um, that you're doing now for an election that's going to take place in 18 months. And as you know, they say, you know, seven days in politics is, is a long time. You're talking about 18 months. But from your own studies, if we take the load shedding as an example, you have shown how bad things have gone this year, 2022. And that red line remains etched on my mind that is in your that, that, that was there. So if it has gone so bad in such a short space of time, what is it going to look like in 18 months' time? What is the, the, the latest crime statistics also showed a horrendous picture? Because it's over 7,000 murders in the last quarter. And that may continue. So all those issues, unemployment, crime, corruption, load shedding, if they continue on the current trajectory for the next 18 months, then you're not even talking 40, it's going to be way below 40, you know, 30% at that rate. So when you talk about you're able to make a plan, usually you're able to make a plan when things are working. But if things are deteriorating at this rate, you won't even be able to make a plan of any, of any such. So let me just stop there before I get, I don't want to get booted out. <laughs> <laughs> we love that <laughs> um, look, a lot of these issues are entrenched. Yeah. And, and having been in the position I was before, on a daily basis, I always say to myself, what would I do if I was president of South Africa? And I have what I think are answers, which I won't say here, because that would be very uh, presumptuous of me to do so. But it's something which, you know, I think every South African asks themselves, what would I do if I was in this situation and I was able to make decisions here, then, anywhere on, on, on these issues? Um, and it's something I would prefer to run away from because they are so entrenched. And when things become so entrenched to overcome them, like someone earlier said, the amount of time it takes to, for things to go wrong, uh, to get them back, you're gonna spend uh, even longer trying to put them right. So good luck. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I think I would like to latch on to what President Kono was saying. And that is, uh, the vast majority of South Africans don't want to have the situation that it is anymore. They want something better. I have no doubt about that. The vast majority of South Africans. And the real question is, how do we combine that effort to which the majority of South Africans can buy into? And, uh, and I think this presentation is aiming at that sort of thing. I was asking myself when we started, I was asking myself primarily the question, what is going to be the situation after the election of 2024? And what can we do before then to ensure an outcome that we find acceptable going forward? That is the key. And, and so this presentation can help people to start thinking about that and mobilize the minds of the majority of South Africans in the right direction, then they will know what to do. But it will also influence the forming of coalitions prior to that election. I'm not saying parties will go into the election with, a, with an agreed basis yet, but at least they will know what potential outcome it will have for them in terms of forming coalitions. And I think if we have to find a working coalition at the national level, it has to be taken show prior to the election. 
That is the key. That is the that is the way in which coalitions in other parts of the world work effectively. And I think this is part of this exercise how to move us in the right direction as far as that is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I really appreciate the feedback. Uh, I think it's very helpful. We'll keep iterating these and socializing them further. I think there's a common issue. South Africans are not present common. Of people around this table who actually are working, not just hoping for, but actually working towards a better South Africa, because it's clear to me, if nothing else, that this situation is unsustainable. And this, you know, like we were at the end of apartheid in the late 1980s, something had to give. Fortunately, we had the leadership at the time that allowed for it to give in a way that was constructive, not destructive. Three very quick things. One is, I do believe coalition politics are the future. To your point, Ken, we, we do look at alternatives. I mean, it's interesting that, that most South Africans poll favor, it's only small margins, a non-ANC coalition. The second favorite is an ANC DA coalition. <coughs> that clearly needs some more refinement in understanding how that evolves over time. But we are heading to a future of coalition politics. As those coalitions, I believe, Herman, become larger, in other words, if the, the size of the majority changes, they will become easier to manage. Almost by definition, you, did, you have less disruption built into a multi-party coalition. So I think we should prepare ourselves for a future to Malcolm's point too, where coalition politics are, are part of the game. The second point is that we face a very clear indicator as to the pathway we are going to take in the next week. The ANC conference, as Ray illustrated, is actually going to be an early indicator of which direction we head in. If the RET faction manages to take key positions. We are at best going to end in the model along scenario. At worst, we're going to end in a scenario which looks red, not just in ideological terms, but in, in danger terms as well. And the third uh, point I would just make is the one I amplified at the beginning is we, we shouldn't think that somehow there's a miracle out there that somehow we're going to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. It's going to be incredibly hard work and people are going to have to all be participants in this process because we are all going to shape these outcomes, whether we're individual voters or, or, um, party, uh, leaders. or party leaders or, or leaders of this country. But I don't believe, Ken, to the point that we can continuously rely on the conspiracy of optimism, because the conspiracy of optimism has led us to where we are today. Believing coalitions may be the same conspiracy. Maybe, we, we don't know that. We also don't know, the, we also don't know that, that we're heading towards that, whether we, yeah. we, we like it or not. So, but we, we are in a conspiracy of optimism and we somehow believe that some other configuration in that conspiracy is going to is going to deliver us from, from where we are. So I thank you for your time. Thank you for your inputs. Um, as I say, we'll continuously uh, iterate this and socialize this. I thank Rolf and his team, Ivor and others, sincerely for helping to shape our thoughts and people who are not here today, they have already gone on holiday, who, who helped us uh, in this regard. Uh, but let me make the final word yours. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, just thanks everyone for coming. and. We will have lunch here, so if you could just take five minutes, there's a bar, there are bathrooms down the passage. Uh, there's a coffee machine, which was in high demand earlier, so. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll just bring the, the food into this room. And uh, also the, the presentation is already up on our website, so you can get that. And an excellent article from Greg and Rolf is up on the website as well, I guess. So, yeah. Foundation. Oh. And we will send you the presentation.